Today on Switch to Linux, we are going to talk about how you can secure your banking to the next level with a great build of Linux Mint. But we're going to use a specific version for a specific reason and use it in such a way to isolate your bank accounts in a secure manner. So stay tuned. Thanks for checking out this video from Switch to Linux, where we teach you how to switch to Linux, why to switch to Linux, and a little bit of tips and tricks throughout. Well, today we are going to talk about securing your banking with Linux. Even if you're using Windows for most of your things, it's always a wise idea to have your banking done on a different computer so that if your main computer that you're using regular, you're on the internet, you're browsing around, if that happens to get compromised and you don't have any of your banking information on that computer, then hey, you're completely safe. Now you might say, hey, I don't have to worry about that. I use my phone for banking. Well, that's even worse. We have situations right now, big crime is moving into a lot of big cities in America, and people are just stealing your phone while you're using it walking down the street. It is actually happening. If they do that, your phone is unlocked, it is in a criminal's hands, and they can now use it and drain your bank accounts. Additionally, if your phone gets stolen or otherwise compromised, then all of that information is there, not to mention the fact that all of these banking apps also carry with it a lot of different trackers and things which can be used to collect a lot of data against you for a lot of different purposes and you want to minimize all of that. So what we're going to do is teach you today how you can do a Linux banking computer and the reason we want to do this is we want to be able to set it up in such a way that everything can be easily isolated from everything else that even on that same computer bank A will not even know that bank E B exists. And that's really what our purpose is. Now you might say, I don't have money to buy another computer. That's perfectly okay because this works best on a USB flash drive. Now make sure you get something that's USB, I'd say 3.0 or above, uh, 3.2 is better this day and age. And you do not need a lot bigger than a 64 gigabyte. So this whole drive cost me a whopping $10. I'm going to install Linux on this drive such that I can use this plugged into any computer. I can boot it up. I can do my banking and close it down. Now we're going to encrypt this drive. So if it happens to get lost somewhere, people can't get in there and gain access to it. However, you do want to make sure you have regular backups as running full Linux distributions on flash drives is not the most predictable. Generally, they last for usually with regular, with not like day to day use, but you do your banking maybe once or twice a week or something, this will last you a good couple of years. Of course, if you go back into the archives on my channel, you might find that I have a few other videos talking about this very thing. And effectively, what we're doing today is we are updating it. I believe my first one, we used Lubuntu. Our second one, we've used Peppermint. And this one, we're going to be switching over to Linux Mint XFCE. Now, why am I going to pick that particular distribution? Well, Lubuntu was the lightest Ubuntu we could get at the time. Peppermint OS, however, came out with a lot of maturity in the area around being super lightweight and effectively like an answer to Chromebooks. But in the recent years, sadly, the main developer has passed away and the current team has not yet completely solidified where they're going and they seem to be all over with their different approaches. And for that reason, I'd rather stick with something that is very mature. Linux Mint XFCE, meanwhile, in the last time since I've done that that video in the past on Peppermint has introduced the same application that made Peppermint so attractive, and that is the web app application. Of course, in Peppermint, it was called the Ice Manager. So what this allows you to do is create a separate isolized container as a full menu item for any individual website. And it will use whatever web browser you have, like between like five of them. You can do a Chrome, a Chromium, uh, Firefox, probably a LibreWolf. You can use one of those particular browsers, create an isolized container instance, and then you can actually use that, one of those for each of your banks. And this allows you to stay logged into your banks without any of your banks seeing any other ones. And since we are not going to be doing anything on this computer except logging into banking, maybe updating some some banking related software, then we don't need to worry about things like email applications and things like that. And 
so we can maintain maximum overall security. Now, since this is a small device, make sure it has a regular home. For me, I have a little box of thumb drives and they're all labeled. And this one, it either is in a computer being actively used or it comes right out of the computer right back in that same spot. You could also opt to put it in a safe and you might also want to make sure that you have regular backups of this. So once a month, I'll make a full backup of every bit of data that is on this drive so that when I'm going to transport it, as we're going to do uh, here soon, off camera, of course, as I'm not going to show you my real bank accounts or things, then I'll be able to migrate that. And then I usually will keep the old one around for at least a few months, make sure things are running smoothly on the new card. So with that, let's go ahead and chat about what we're going to do. As I said, we are going to use Linux Mint XFCE. So if you go on over to linuxmint.com, click your download in Linux Mint 21.3, which is the current. Of course, if you're watching this a few weeks out, uh, 22 is right around the corner. So just grab whatever the current latest one is. And you can see there's a couple different editions. I'm using XFCE because it is super lightweight. It's going to work well for most operating systems and it's going to be a system that's going to predictably work on pretty much everything. You hit your download button and you're going to go ahead and download your drive. Now, since this is a production computer on banking, do not skip the verify step. Now, if you go back and look at my videos on how we converted a Windows 11 computer to Linux Mint, then I showed you how to verify a drive on Windows. I will refer you to that video as there's a few small changes. I think we use GTK hash. I think that one might be the one that has went defunct. So there's a couple other versions out there that allows you to do that. If you're using Mac or Linux, it's quite easy. Uh, what we're going to do is click on this guy here, uh, showing you the SHA uh, 256 sums. And then this gives you all of the files. The one we are concerned with is the Linux Mint XFCE. Uh, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to boot up a terminal, jump over to my full desktop. I'm going to boot up a terminal. I'm going to navigate to where this is at. So I keep these guys, well, not in the desktop. I keep these guys in downloads. And then most of these are going to be inside of test. And then these are the ones that you might see videos of in the upcoming future. These are the things that are in my in my pile of two uh, to do things here. So let me go ahead and increase the size for you here. So what we're going to do is now that we're here, we're going to do SHA 256 sum. And then we're going to type in the name of the of the distribution. I'm just going to go ahead and uh, hit tab and that's going to give us our full file there. So you can see that this is a 21.3 XFCE 64 bit. And we're going to, this will take just a few minutes. And what this is going to do is it's going to give us the SHA sum number. That number should match this number here. I'll go ahead and copy that one. All right, so we'll paste that in all in so we can see it all in one line. I usually just check the first few characters here, check the last few characters here, and look for something predictable we can find in the middle, like that 48331 should be easy to find, 48331. So if I'm getting a few different spots like this, which are very easy to spot that are predictable, then I'm calling that good. Now that we have this all set up, what we're going to do now is we're going to write that ISO. So let's go ahead and pull up our USB image writer. Once again, if you're on Windows, refer you to the video. Here's Rufus, there's Etcher. There's a few other options that you have to burn something if you're not already on Linux. But there's a number of ways. In this case, it's just easiest to use the USB image writer. If you don't have that available to you, uh, you're going to want to check out online for the best way to copy an image over. So we'll go ahead and find our, i got to make sure I grab the right one because I have a couple different things in here for testing. Uh, Linux Mint 21.3, and then we need to choose where to put it to. And apparently my drive is not in there. It should be. Let me check that again. There you go. Okay, so this was one of our live tests. I think uh, I think this might be a test I was doing to test some persistence, but I don't need that. Let's go ahead and write this. So what this is doing here is this is simply writing the installation disk. So we're going to need an installation disk, and then we're going to need a target disk. So once this is done writing, then we can go ahead and boot into it. Well, we're working on that. 
Our installation disk is any other USB drive lo floating around. Um, our target disk is going to be this guy here. So this is a SanDisk UltraFit USB 3.2 Gen 1 flash drive. So we're going to go ahead and open this guy up. And now we have a nice little flash drive that we're going to burn that that uh, image onto. So once this is done, we're going to come right back up and I'm going to walk through the next steps of actually installing this onto the system. So here we are actually in more of a side you don't often see of the van here and uh, see confirmed back doors of a van in case you thought I was faking it. But what we're going to do here is we're going to get the computer all set up. Now, there is an issue with Linux Mint that if you have multiple hard drives, it will tend to want to install the bootloader onto the main hard drive, not the drive you're targeting if there's multiple drives there. This appears to be a bug, but it's been confirmed by myself and a number of other people uh, looking at Linux Mint. And so I'm not sure if there's a fix for that coming down the road. Best recommendation here, if possible, remove the drive from your computer. This is not as difficult as one might think, but of course, double check that it won't break a warranty or anything like that. If you have a desktop computer, usually this just means opening it up and pulling either the power cable to the hard drive or the SATA cable to the hard drive or both. Either one is fine. Now, if you have a laptop, they might be soldered in depending on what it is, or you might have the option to uh, open it up and take out the uh, take out the physical drive. You also though might have a third option and that is in the BIOS, it might very well be possible to completely disable the internal drive. So go ahead and check that as an option and make sure that you can boot the system up and make sure that if you try and start it after you've disabled that drive, it says, hey, there's no drive here, can't boot, you know, uh, then you're probably in the clear there as well. Just, I have not thoroughly tested that, although maybe I probably should. Nevertheless, that being said, do whatever you can if possible to remove that first drive. Now, in my case, I have actually built my computer specifically for this type of stuff. And so I have all my drives on an IC dock and I just have to push a button, bink, no more power to the drive. Now I can go ahead and do whatever I need to do without having to worry about it. So what I'm gonna do is I'm going to take the installation medium. This is the, the drive that we just created. I'm gonna go ahead and plug this in somewhere where the drive can boot. And again, you wanna use USB 3 ports. Now, you also probably wanna keep the two drives on two separate USB channels. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna put this in one of the slower ones, uh, maybe the port up front, or if there's an external, I have an external USB 3 port I installed up here. So I'm just gonna go ahead and do that. And then we're going to plug the second one into one of the onboard, the USB ports that soldered directly onto the motherboard, usually on the back of the computers. So I'm gonna use this one right here. So I'm gonna go ahead and show you there or where I plug these guys in because I realized this monitor is kind of in the way. So I have this card up here is a external USB uh, three device. I installed it as a card reader because of all the cameras and stuff. And then the other one I use the onboard one and it's right, is it right there, I think, uh, right over there next to the um, Ethernet port. So that one is on board. So the one that's on the Ethernet port, eh, right there, this one is the drive that it is being installed to. This is the installation media that we are booting from. This one is a PNY, the other one is a SanDisk. That is going to be important because what we're going to do now is boot the computer on, and then I'm going to hit the one-time boot menu, and then that's going to allow us to boot up the computer, choosing where we're going to boot this guy to. So let's go ahead and do that. And in this case, on my computer, this is the F11 key. So I'm gonna spam the F11 key until I see a one-time boot menu show up in my device here. Okay, so in my one-time boot menu, you can see I have some options here. I have a USB, I have a PNY, and it doesn't actually see the SanDisk one, mostly because there's nothing on that particular drive. So. We're just gonna go ahead and we can probably pick either one of these. Linux Mint does a pretty good job of partitioning. Let's go ahead and give this one a try and that should boot us into Linux Mint. There we are. Now we have Linux Mint. We have Linux Mint compatibility mode. We have an OEM install. So, and then boot from the next volume, which is the be the next, next drive. 
All right, so we can better see what's going on here. I went ahead and set up a capture card over here and we are going to record the screen directly on a capture card on this little nice laptop here. So let's go ahead and close this guy out of the way. And what we're going to do is start by installing Linux Mint. Now there is nothing going to be anything super amazing on this particular part here. You've seen me install Linux Mint several times, mostly on VMs. Only in this case, we are installing it onto real hardware. So we're gonna start in by making sure we have our language selected and then our keyboards. I don't know if we're gonna need multimedia codecs, but let's go ahead and install them just to be sure. You know, we might need, I don't know what we might need that for. We probably don't need that at all, but we're gonna go ahead and do that in case there's some like PDF or something weird. So we wanna erase disk. This is where we want to run um, encryption. So we're going to use LVM with the new Mint install. We're going to encrypt it. And now what we're going to do is, let's double check. Okay, encrypt it for security. So hit the install now. Now we have to choose a security key. Okay, so we have a good password. It matches. We can enable a recovery key if you, we want to. I'm not going to worry about that because I make regular backups of this particular guy. We do not need to do more security. Uh, that's going to take a ton of extra time and it's completely unnecessary, especially for a drive I just pulled out of the package right now. So this step here is going to write the changes to the disk. That is the point of no return. Once you do that step, it's going to start partitioning the disk. Now at this point in time, we want to make sure that we enter the information. So this is full production. So I'm going to enter the username as I want and I'm going to enter the password. So I can do something like banking. Uh, I'm just going to do my name here on this one and then we'll give it a good secure password. So now that's strong and then require it to log in. Now, if I wanted the extra extra security, I could also encrypt the home folder. I'm not going to do that in this case because we already have at rest disk encryption. And this just adds a second at rest encryption, which is probably unnecessary at this point in time. If you wanna see the lack of funds in my bank accounts that bad to get through the first round, well, congratulations. So this point in time, this is going to take some time to install, depending on the speed of your uh, hardware. This could take anywhere from 15 minutes up to maybe an hour. So we're going to go ahead and let this guy go, and then we'll come back when this is done and show you our next steps. Our installation is now done. So now what we need to do is reboot the system. So having a look at the main screen here, we're just going to go ahead and hit the restart now button. And then it's going to go through the shutdown sequence. And then it's going to ask us then to remove the installation media and then hit enter. So remove our installation media, hit enter. Now I do find that all of these errors here that shows up, that's common thing there on Linux Mint. So I'm not super worried about that. Uh, there's a lot of distros will have a little odds and ends in the, in the back of their files. But let's go ahead and boot this guy up and see what happens. So we get booted into a screen and it asks us for our password here. So we're gonna go ahead and enter that. It says it's set up successfully. So this means that the at-risk disk encryption is working. So now we are moving on to uh, an activated drive. And now we just need to log in with our password. All right, so on first boot of the system here, now we're just gonna walk through any of our steps. Do I wanna change any of the colorations or anything like that? Being that this is a, uh, you know, my, my regular full-fledged professional system here or not. Uh, I don't know if it necessarily makes a difference if we do or not. All right, I think we're gonna stick with this mint wide dark gray. I like that one overall. We got a little dark, dark windows, dark things. I don't worry about system snapshots. Don't worry about the driver manager on this. Mostly the only other thing I actually want to do right now is look at what type of software is installed and remove things I actually don't need. So uh, Redshift. Generally, I don't like Redshift, so we're going to remove things like that. Um, I probably, I don't know, maybe I could experiment with Warpinator. Might make backups easier to use. I don't generally do drawing. Um, we're going to remove hex chat. We'll move transmission. We'll move... Thunderbird. Now the one application we're going to keep there and the one we're going to focus on is going to be web apps. So let's go ahead and start by removing a few applications and let's see if we can easily do that. All right, so now that we have our software manager set up, 
we're gonna go ahead and see, can I sh search for just install? It's not gonna show me just the installed applications, which is kind of sad. That's kind of what I'd like to see in there. Um, mostly because what I wanna be able to do is uninstall stuff more easily. On Linux Mint Cinnamon, you can right click and uninstall things. So we're gonna have to search things up. Let's just do Thunderbird. And you'll see that that is there. Let's go ahead and remove it. It's gonna remove all of these, continue. So here's your Redshift. We're gonna remove that. You see that this pot process is gonna be a little bit annoying to do, just removing all the applications. Like I said, in Linux Mint Cinnamon, it's a little easier because you can just right click the item in the menu and uninstall it. But uh, in this case, so you see we have to remove both of those. Although if we remove this one first, it probably would have taken the other one with it. All right, I think we've pretty much taken care of everything that uh, we wanted to uninstall. Now we'll go ahead and hit our update manager. So we wanted to uninstall things first because if we just uninstall a bunch of things, if there was an update to one of those applications, then for sure it would have updated and then we remove things. So go ahead and uninstall all of the software that you'd like to uninstall first. And then we're gonna go ahead and run our download. And now we have a bunch of things that need updated. See, look at this, it's still trying to do transmission. Why? I got rid of transmission. I'm gonna refresh the package cache again. Yeah, I don't know why transmission is still set here, um, being as that that has been removed. We're gonna go ahead and just install updates. I'm gonna keep that there, see if it's trying to reinstall it again. If it is, we'll go ahead and check our software once it's done. So we'll come back after this is done doing its installation. This might take, you know, five minutes or so. All right, so we are back after the update and let's go ahead and turn this guy off at startup. I don't need that anymore. And we'll go ahead and make sure that the um, application, so transmission was in that list, but it did not update. It didn't show up because we had deleted it, so. That's what I was hoping would happen. So now we have updated our system. We've removed the software we do not need. And now we're gonna talk about why I'm using this particular application. It deals with the web apps. So the web apps allow you to create uh, basically a web application containerized inside of an available browser on the system. And it makes sure that each one of these can be put into a separate isolated container. So we're gonna come ahead and let's just set up a couple banks. So let's say you have an account at Chase. And I went over here just to make sure that either the home pages have the login or double check that where that should be. So we'll go ahead and paste this guy in. And if we hit the button over here, it's gonna look for icons online to allow us to use our icon from this. So we can choose which icon we'd like to use. There you go, we'll use that. Now you can choose where it goes, and if you have multiple different browsers installed, you can choose which browser it uses. You can turn on the navigation bar. This might be beneficial depending on which bank you're using. Uh, the private or incognito window, of course, is going to clear all cookies and things unless you set specific exceptions. So I usually leave that one off because each of these guys should be containerized away from all of the uh, all of the other applications. That way it keeps everything from, uh, from communicating with each other. So we'll go ahead and say we got that one. Let's set up another one at Wells Fargo. So you do this for each one of your individual accounts. So we'll go ahead and do that. Paste that in there and look for icons online. This should be finding the fave icons for the site or things like that. So we can choose which one we want. Maybe we'll do that one. Once again, we'll drop it under internet and we'll give it, we'll keep this one with the navigation bar off. So there we have it, we have two web applications. And so what we're gonna do is under internet, you can see that now I have these as individual guys here. What I found is adding to panel um, didn't generally work on this one, but if you just drag it down, it should in theory. Don't make a liar out of me thing. There you go, see that red line there? That means you're set to go. Hit create launcher. And then we're gonna come over here and do Wells Fargo. Once again, drag it around until you see that plus, create the launcher. 
and now you can move them in whatever orientation you'd like them to be. So now you can set up all of your banks. Um, let's see, I don't usually use the terminal on this particular one, so we'll remove that. I might just want a, a random Firefox instance, but now I can come over here, hit this, and it just takes me right to my chase. And I can hit this one here, and it will take me right to our, um, right to our Wells Fargo. If it loads. All right, so here you can see it pulled it right back up. Now we can go ahead and log in. If you want to save your logins, you can do that. That can be a little bit risky. Come on, why is it not transferring data? There it is, okay. I'm on a fairly slow internet connection right now for downloads. But there you have it. You can see each one of these guys are, um, are actually loading themselves up as their, own, as their own special app. So now I can harden Firefox as well. You might want to think about doing that. For me, I don't generally use Firefox outside of these containers. And these containers should be individual containers. So if you, let's see, hit the menu button and let's look at our history. So you see that the, this particular one here, we only see the Wells Fargo and we only see our, uh, our initial privacy notice. We'll pull up Chase and let's go ahead and look at our history here. Show all history. And now you see that this particular instance only has the Chase and the Firefox. So that tells us that each one of these are completely containerized. So now I can go ahead and do that for each of the individual banks. You might need to install software. Maybe you have GNU Cash. Maybe you're using KMyMoney or other applications like that. You can install all of those. But now we have a hardened system that now, once, the, uh, once I'm done working with all of my banking and things like that, then at this point in time, I just shut this computer down, save this drive in its special location, and now it's perfectly good. It'll also should boot off of any other computer. So we're gonna do that as our last test here. We're gonna shut the computer down here, and then we're gonna try and boot this up in my separate laptop. So we'll check that out here just right now. All right, so here we have another laptop here, and we're gonna go ahead and boot this guy up. And this one's a Dell, so it's one time boot menu is to spam the F12 key. So go ahead and do that. All right, so I boot into this guy here, and my one time boot menu, I have some legacy options. Now we installed that under UEFI, so I wanna skip the legacy options because that might just boot back into the hard drive on this computer. But we're gonna go down, and there's a USB Uf, uh, UEFI on the USB drive. We're gonna go ahead and hit that button there and that should be booting off of the thumb drive now. And it does look like it is as the uh, login on Linux Mint 20, I think this is 21.3 is a little bit different than the one that's 20, which this laptop is still running 20, whereas the one that we just installed is 21. And so it looks as though it is properly working off of the correct drive but we'll see what happens here. All right, so this definitely looks like the one we just built as the wallpaper I have on my internal hard drive here is a little bit different. So let's go ahead and get logged in. And of course my mouse cursor is different. That matches in exactly what we need. And you can see that this is the one that we just built. We have XFCE. Here is our Chase Manhattan Bank right here. Here's our Wells Fargo over here. Now at this point in time, I usually plug this computer directly in to the internet. I don't usually use the wireless. I can plug in the wireless if I want to, but for extra security, I always just plug this guy directly into the internet. But this is the correct build. So now we've installed this on one computer and now we are properly using it on the other. So there is all the steps that we need to do to make a good Linux-based secure banking drive. We have a small USB drive. We have it in a predictable place. It's as a drive is completely encrypted and every bank system is set up with its own isolated container and we have uninstalled any software that we do not absolutely need. With that, thank you for watching. Let me know if you've had luck with this. I, like I said, I've been doing this for years, so uh, we're good there. I've had, this has been tried and tested in my office. So with that, thanks for watching, and I hope that you enjoy switching to Linux.